the year 2011 will go down in history as one of the most destructive years on record. According to a recent report by the London School of Economics, $370 billion worth of disaster damage occurred in 2011. This is an all-time record. This breaks the previous record of $210 billion set in 2005. That was the year of Katrina. The triple cascading disasters in Japan, that of the earthquake, the tsunami, and the Fukushima incidents contributed mostly to this. This was followed by the floods in Thailand, which contributed to $50 billion worth of damage. What is significant about disaster damage is that this damage is for real. This is in brick and mortar. This is in damaged cars, lost industrial production. This cannot be fixed by interest rate adjustments. This cannot be, you know, this will not come back when the stock exchange bounces back. We must also remember that the phenomenal human cost involved in a disaster of death, suffering, children becoming orphaned, parents losing their children is not even counted. So we all must have an interest in the question, are disasters preventable? We, the faithful practitioners of the art of disaster risk reduction believes all disasters are preventable. Natural hazards such as tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, volcanoes will always be there. But it is action and often the lack of action of policymakers which convert a natural hazard into a disaster. Before you start to think that I am sort of an academic who spins fantastic theories, let me tell you something about myself. I made my entire career responding to disasters, not preventing them. I have been doing so ever since I respond to the, responded to the first oil spill in Borneo, Brunei. Since then, I have been involved in responding to almost every major disaster of the 21st century. The 2005 Southeast Asian tsunami, uh, the cyclone Nargis in Myanmar, the Wenchuan earthquake in China, the earthquake in Haiti, and the recent floods in Thailand. In fact, I'm just back from Japan where we are following the response of the government of Japan to the tsunami. My life is so entwined with disaster response that my wife often tells me that I should write an autobiography and call it my life and other disasters. <laughs> now, after seeing all these disasters in countries rich and poor, disasters which come with no warning, disasters which kill tens of thousands of people in less than a day, do I still believe all disasters are preventable? I do. And today, I want to tell you why I'm so passionate about this. Let me start in Japan. On the 11th of March last year, an earthquake hit Japan. On a technical scale, it had a magnitude of nine. On a practical level, this was the biggest earthquake ever to hit Japan. And that is saying something, because Japan has a long history of earthquakes. The earthquake was so powerful that the main Japanese island of Honshu shifted 2.4 meters to the east. Scientists say the entire globe shifted 10 to 25 centimeters off its axis. So we can never comprehend the power of this earthquake. Down in Tokyo, hundreds of kilometers from the epicenter of this earthquake, skyscrapers swayed. We all saw that on the television. The Japanese rail tracks through which the famous Shinkansen, the bullet trains, travel at 300 kilometers per hour, bent and cracked. Yet, the number of people who actually lost their lives due to this earthquake was 246. Why? Because Japan had put in place engineering codes which allowed things to happen in a safe manner. So when the earthquake came, the building swayed but did not collapse. The train tracks bent, but the trains all detected that there was an earthquake, they came to a sudden and safe stop. Better engineering codes have sa had saved thousands of lives. Of course, any death is one too many. But if you really want to understand how many lives may have been saved that day by better engineering codes, you have to look at another disaster, just one year back. On the 12th of January, 2010, Port-au-Prince, the capital city of Haiti, was hit by an earthquake. It had a magnitude of seven. It brought down the palace of the president, the Supreme Court, the main cathedral, and tens of thousands of other buildings. When the dust settled, there were more than 200,000 people dead. I was in Muscat, the capital city of Oman, attending a conference on disaster reduction when I was called back and deployed to Haiti. The airport in Port-au-Prince was still closed. I had to take a helicopter from Santo Domingo 
to Port-au-Prince and then take a four-wheel drive and finally walk my way into the humanitarian operation base. All through the road, on either side, there are dead bodies because there was nobody to bury them. And behind them were the buildings which killed them. I'm a civil engineer. I was taught that earthquake, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. And on that day, I was watching that theory in action. I took this image in Jackmel, one of the uh, city, uh, southern cities of Haiti. And you see three buildings here, three generations. You see a wooden building at the right end, you see a concrete building, and you see a steel building. The wooden building, three-storied, more than 100 years old. This, the building in the middle is modern concrete building. This collapsed, and I was told 12 people lost their lives here. It is not that you cannot design a concrete building to stand an earthquake. It's not even that it, they are more expensive. You really need a building code. One could argue that a poor country like Haiti cannot afford building codes like Japan. Now, this is not true. We are not talking about building a skyscraper in Port-au-Prince. At a more basic level, you know, it is not a very expensive thing to do. It is just that you need a public policy which promotes better building codes and an, and an enforcement mechanism which does that. So this is my rule number one. We must always use modern science to deal with consequence of non-natural disasters. Let me now go back to Japan. The earthquake set in motion a tsunami. And within minutes, tsunami was pounding the east coast of Japan. The earthquake was so, the tsunami was so powerful that it swept entire houses of their foundation. We again saw that on the television. In the coastal city of Rikusen, Takada, only one tree out of a forest of 70,000 trees survived the tsunami onslaught. And this tree has since become a national monument, a place where people go and worship, a symbol of resilience of the Japanese people. I was in Minami Sanriku, another coastal town, and the city still had not cleaned up. There are boats in the city center, cars were on the rooftop. And along the road to the, rest, the shelter where people ran, I came across this image. You see an electric pole, and the top of this pole is a wooden bed frame. And the water must have been at least that high. And remember, this is the road people were running up to the shelter. And there I am standing, and I'm wondering, if I was chased by a wall of water that high, would I even have the mental stamina to run? On the day of the tsunami, Japan lost close to 20,000 people. Most of them drowned or presumed drowned. We all know that Japan is one of those countries which is most prepared to deal with a disaster. How could this happen in Japan? Before I answer that question, let me tell you a few things Japan got right that day. Within three minutes of the earthquake, the Japanese Meteorological Organization had issued warnings of a tsunami. This was conveyed down by all means of communication, radio, television, internet, telephones, mobile phones. Every village in Japan has a community disaster management center. The information was picked up and was spread over the loudspeakers. Vulnerable, vulnerable groups in schools, hospitals, old age homes were individually called and were asked to evacuate. And people also knew exactly what to do when, when an evacuation order came. They all had to run to the shelters. They had to do it independently. And this is important. As you know, the earthquake happened at 2.46 in the afternoon. Children were still at school. So when the warning came, if all the parents had rushed to the school, then mothers, fathers, children, teachers, everyone would be dead. But they didn't do that. They all made their way independent. But the death toll was this high because the initial predictions were not accurate enough. So people died even after they had reached the shelter because the shelters were not high enough. People died even as they were running away from the tsunami because you know, the, the predictions didn't say it will come that far. Now you could ask if Japan, with all its sophistication, could not predict this disaster. Could you really prevent this disaster? The answer to that question lies in history and not in science. And here, actually, we are on really weak ground. As a society, we are really poor at keeping record of disasters. We all know everything about um, wars and tra wars which happened in history. For the last 1,000 years, 
who were our friends, who were our enemies, whom we fought, who won, who lost. This we know. But even for the last 100 years, we don't know what were the major disasters, even in our own countries. Even here, Japan is an exception. They have found a way of hardwiring disaster memory into their history. So they have disasters in their proverbs, in their fairy tales. They have physical stones all along the Japanese coastline indicating how high the tsunami came. Down in the Shandai Plain, there's a temple called Nami Wake. In Japanese, the word Nami means wave, like tsunami for harbor waves. Nami Wake means parting of the waves. So the local legend says that in 869 AD, during the reign of Emperor Jorgen, a tsunami came and was stopped by the shrine. I had been to this shrine multiple number of times. It is 5.5 kilometers from the beach. You cannot see the sea from there. You cannot even listen to the sound of the waves from there. So if two years back, somebody had told me that a tsunami came here, I would have thought it, yeah, some sort of old wife's tale. But not everyone took this claim lightly though. Professor Imamura and his team at the Disaster Control Research Center at Tohoku University decided to do some digging, literally. His research was so intuitive that I wonder why it is not replicated all over the world. So he dug a series of trenches from the beach towards the land and his hypothesis was if you found a continuous layer of sand on the land and if the origin of the sand was from the sea, then it must have come through a tsunami. And when he did come across sea sand, he took a sample and sent it out for carbon dating to find how old these uh, samples were. And based upon this research, he made two conclusions and two predictions. Conclusion number one, in the last 3,000 years, there are three events of mega tsunami which hit the Sentai Plain. Conclusion number two, the average interval between these events were 850 to 1100 years. Prediction number one, since 1100 years had passed since the last mega tsunami, the event which I mentioned, AD 869, the possibility of a similar event is high. Prediction number two, such an event would inundate 2.5 to 3 kilometers inland. He published his results in 2001, Journal of Natural Disaster Science. Now, since most of us don't read Journal of Natural Disaster Science, or any journal for that matter, I have put that information on a Google Earth file here. What you see, the yellow pin on the top is the Nami Wake Shrine, and that's where the, they say the tsunami came once. You see the beach, of course, and then you see the red line parallel to the beach, which is the predicted li line of tsunami. And you know, I have used the 2.5 kilometer, not the three kilometer mark. And then you see a yellow rectangle, which is the Arahama village. And I want you to look at the next image. This image is 2009. You don't see the Arahama village. The tsunami came to Arahama village at 3.30 on March 11th. That was 41 minutes after the tsunami warnings were issued. 44 minutes after the earthquake, 10 years after Professor Imamura had made his predictions, 1,142 years after the, the Jorgen tsunami, was this disaster preventable? So my lesson number two is, we must always look backward before we plan forward. The good thing about living in Geneva is that we don't have to worry about tsunamis here. Lake Geneva is actually very shallow, it doesn't happen. But since continental Europe hasn't had any recent history of disaster other than the Euro, people, <laughs> people assume that Europe is a safe place too. Now this is not true. Europe has a long history of earthquake and tsunamis. On the 1st of November 1755, an earthquake hit the Portuguese town of Lisbon. The survivors of this earthquake were intrigued by the fact that the sea had receded from the harbor. Now we know this is so typical of an impending tsunami. Now people didn't know that and people in Southeast Asia didn't know this. So everyone rushed to see all the shipwrecks which had become exposed. 40 minutes later, a tsunami rushed in, filled the harbor, filled the city center, rushed up the Tagus River. History says 30 to 40,000 people lost their lives that day in Lisbon. 
we can talk a lot about disaster risk reduction, but today I want you to want to leave you with just two thoughts. Number one, we should always use modern science to deal with the consequence of non-natural disasters. And lesson number two, we must always look backward before you plan forward. Natural disasters will always be there. There will always be tsunamis. There will always be earthquakes. There will always be floods. But if we build our public policy around the, around the simple principles of disaster risk reduction, we can prevent disasters. Thank you. Marli Tamarakudi, thank you.